Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Edna Zer. And I'm Joyce Wu. Here's the look at tonight's top stories. Showdown expected in Mongkok tomorrow after protesters are served court orders to clear out. British banker found fit to stand trial over murders of two Indonesian women. Driver seeks police action after narrow miss with minibus on wrong lane of Santin Highway. The stage is set for a showdown in Mong Kok where police are ready to help bailiffs when they start enforcing court orders to clear road blockades tomorrow. Notices were served to protesters today, warning them of impending action and the risk of being arrested if they fight back. Die-hard protesters have vowed to stay put while others are willing to shift their main base in Admiralty. Day 58 of the Occupy protests and the focus was on the road blockades in Mong Kok. Court bailiffs accompanied lawyers representing two taxi associations as they put up more than 20 copies of injunctions, ordering the dismantling of barricades. The notices informed pro-democracy protesters they would have to stop occupying a part of Nathan Road between Argyle and Dunder Streets, where traffic has been blocked for two months. The injunctions made it clear that anyone obstructing the enforcement action would be in contempt of court and face arrest. The notices were served today after several appeals by protesters were rejected. Bailiffs for the two taxi associations are expected to move in on Wednesday to remove the barricades on Nathan Road between Argyle Street and Dunder Street. Another injunction secured by a minibus operator is likely to be enforced on Argyle Street tomorrow. With police ready to help enforce the court orders, the stage is set for a showdown in Mong Kok, which has become the most volatile protest site since demonstrators fighting for greater democracy began occupying key roads at the end of September. The normally busy retail hub has been the scene of frequent clashes as local residents and shopkeepers affected by the blockades vent their anger at protesters and suspected tried gangsters have been involved in the violence. Die-hard protesters vowed to stay put despite the notices served today, while others said they would leave. I think this is um, a people's choice and I won't say they have to leave or they have to stay here. And this is their choice, but my choice is to move to Central. When they come, I will leave. I won't stop them because this is the court um, uh, gave the permission to let them to clean up. While the most radical protesters are said to be concentrated around Mong Kok, among them are students who have been playing a leading role in the civil disobedience campaign. Federation of Students member Tommy Jung said today it's up to individual protesters if they want to continue their Mong Kok sit-in. Jung said legal advice has been provided to those camped out there, and the Federation will discuss with other members what action they should take next. Authorities are hoping for a smooth clearance operation, similar to the one they conducted today outside the British Consulate in Admiralty where a handful of protesters had blocked the road. There was no violence or serious resistance when they removed barricades and told protesters to leave. A young British banker accused of killing two Indonesian women in Wan Chai has been found fit to stand trial following psychiatric tests. The trial has been adjourned for more than seven months to give prosecutors time to gather evidence. ATV's Arthur Okeola reports. A correctional services van took Rorik Jutting to Eastern Court this morning for his third appearance in a double murder case. He's accused of killing two Indonesian women whose bodies were found in his upmarket Wan Chai flat earlier this month. After his second appearance two weeks ago, the case was adjourned for a fortnight so that the former trader for Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, could undergo psychiatric tests to determine whether he's fit to plead. The assessments found that the 29-year-old Briton is fit to stand trial. But the case was further adjourned to the 6th of July at the request of prosecutors, who said they need time to examine more than 200 items of forensic evidence, such as DNA tests. Principal Magistrate Bina Chainrai 
so that if the tests are completed earlier, the proceedings can start sooner. Judging was remanded in custody. There was no application for bail, and no plea was taken. The former banker was arrested on the morning after Halloween, after he called police who found the bodies of two Indonesian women in his flat at the Plush J residence on Johnston Road. One of the victims was found in the living room with a deep cut to her neck. The body of the other woman was found eight hours later, stuffed in a suitcase on the balcony. She was believed to have been killed five days earlier. The bodies of both women were sent back to Indonesia. Arthur Akiola, ATV News. Drivers along a busy highway in the northwest New Territories got a shock last night when they spotted a minibus heading straight towards them. One worried driver had a, who had a narrow escape alerted the police, but was told there was nothing officers could do about it. ATV's Winner Wong reports. Footage from this dash cam video shows cars traveling along the busy Santin Highway in the northwest New Territories last night. Suddenly, headlights appear and a minibus is seen driving in the wrong direction. It's in the middle of two lanes heading directly towards the other vehicles. A woman in the car with the dash cam video is shocked. A day after capturing the dramatic event, Kevin Mock recalled the alarm on the highway. I'm driving with my family to a sort of Fanning or Sang Sui. Then suddenly I find that there's a car in the opposite way is coming towards to me. There's the minivan, the green van. But then I feel very shocked. And then I'm trying my best. Try to move a bit to the right then. The minivan just passed. And after that, I then discuss with my wife and my kids that we all thinking it's crazy. It's impossible. When he dialed 999, Mock was told to contact traffic police at the Northern New Territory Station. Mock had hoped that police would be able to deal with the problem, but felt that the officer who took the call was skeptical. He's very, very calm and just like my feeling, just my feeling. feeling I'm just feeling I'm telling the story. And he's listening and trying to analyze the possibility. Because he told me she is not she's suspected. How come there's a van in the opposite way, in the highway, but no one report? And how could the driver do this? And but still no one report. Then that is if really there's the van in the opposite way, there would be the crash in less than a minute, there would be some accidents because in Hong Kong there's many cars in the world. Mark said while he still continues to have faith in the police force, he thinks officers should take reports from drivers more seriously. He's since gone to social media to publicize his video. You can say disappointed. I'm just trying to do my best. I just want to drive the other drivers to know, oh, there's something horrible thing in Suntin Highway. The Police Public Relations Bureau said a call was received at 7.18 last night and officers were sent to the scene, but they couldn't find the minibus and are treating it as a transport complaints case. Winawang, ATV News. There has been a sharp rise in Hong Kong share prices as investors welcomed a surprise cut in mainland interest rates. The reduction was the first in more than two years and was introduced to help stimulate the world's second biggest economy. There was a dramatic change of fortune on the local stock market today. Last week, the Hang Seng Index retreated despite the launch of the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect on Monday. But today, the benchmark surged on the first trading day of the new week as investors welcomed an unexpected cut in mainland interest rates, the first in more than two years. The Hang Seng Index surged by 456 points, or 1.95 percent, to close at 23,893. It was the biggest percentage change in nearly three months. Turnover was sharply higher with $105.2 billion worth of shares changing hands. The People's Bank of China caught markets by surprise when it announced last Friday that borrowing money will become cheaper. 
The move, which took effect on Saturday, is a stimulus measure introduced after fresh statistics suggested that growth in the world's second biggest economy is losing momentum. Gross domestic product between July and September had eased to 7.3 percent, the slowest growth in several years. This triggered fears that GDP for the whole of this year might dip below 7 percent, a rate envied by developed countries. But for China, a rate below 7 percent would be seen as a setback after decades of galloping growth transformed the country into an economic powerhouse. But there could be more stimulus measures. Reports suggest that the central bank in Beijing may cut rates even further and loosen lending restrictions to avert debt defaults, business failures and job losses. A massive economic downturn could invite social unrest, which Beijing wants to avoid at all costs. Mainland stocks also benefited from the rate cut, with the Shanghai Composite Index gaining 1.85 percent to close at a three-year high of 2,532. Overseas, world powers are scrambling to reach a last-minute deal with Iran to halt its nuclear program. Tehran has until tomorrow morning to meet the West's demands, but the deadline may be extended. ATV's Ben O'Rourke reports. Officials from the U.S., Russia, China, Britain, France, Germany and Iran are meeting in Austria for talks aimed at ending United Nations sanctions on Iran in return for halting its nuclear program. A landmark deal was struck in Geneva last year for Iran to give up some of its uranium enrichment in return for the West easing sanctions. But a July deadline for an agreement on how quickly the sanctions will be lifted was extended to tomorrow morning Hong Kong time, and now it seems there's talk of another extension as both sides are still far from an agreement. Uh, I wouldn't want to give any false hopes here. We're still quite a long way apart and there are some very tough and complex issues to deal with, but we're all focused right now on trying to get that deal done. Of course, uh, if we're not able to do it, we'll then look at where we go from there. China's top diplomat, Wang Yi, is at the talks and met Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif earlier today. Wang said another extension could be on the cards if the deadline isn't met. He said there are two possible ways forward, either the parties involved turn the corner and work out another solution or they prolong the talks. At the same time, he said he was optimistic a deal could still be reached in time for the deadline. Iran has signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which allows it to develop atomic energy. But the U.S. and its allies insist the country is trying to make nuclear bombs. Israel, which is nuclear armed itself and hasn't signed the agreement, has even threatened to attack if it believes Tehran is anywhere near developing a bomb. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has been updating Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu regularly on the progress of the past week's talks. Ben O'Rourke, ATV News. A member of a radical pro-democracy group has been granted bail but ordered to stay away from the LegCo building after he appeared in court, accused of storming the legislature last week. But first, in a local rap. Three men in the same public housing estate in Ho Man Tin have all jumped to their deaths within hours of each other. Arthur Akeola reports. Police are investigating three suicides in a three-hour span at a public housing estate in Ho Man Tin today. Officers were called to Oi Man Estate at around 9.30 a.m. after a man jumped from a corridor of Tun Man House. The 43-year-old was unconscious when he was rushed to Kwangwa Hospital where he was certified dead. Shortly after, police found that a 71-year-old man had jumped to his death from the same building. Both men had medical histories. One was suffering from a sleep disorder and the other had cancer. At noon, a third man was found dead after he jumped from another building in the same estate. A member of the radical pro-democracy group Civic Passion was taken in a police van to Eastern Port this morning in connection with the storming of the LegCo building last week. Chung Ka Hin, nicknamed French Guy, was charged with criminal damage. His lawyer complained that he had been detained for more than 48 hours after his arrest on Friday, suggesting it was punishment for being uncooperative during interrogation. Chung did not enter a plea, and the case was adjourned to the 19th of January for further police inquiries. He was released on $1,000 bail but ordered to stay at least 300 meters away from the LegCo complex. The Journalist Association is calling on the Philippine Consul General 
to lift a ban on nine Hong Kong reporters and cameramen. They have been listed as undesirables and barred from entering the Philippines after being accused of heckling Philippine President Benigno Aquino during an APEC summit on the Indonesian island of Bali in October last year. The journalists had shouted questions at Aquino about demands for an apology and compensation for the eight Hong Kong residents killed in the Manila hostage tragedy in 2010. The nine were only made aware of the ban when one of them was refused entry when he tried to visit the Philippines for a holiday recently. Such a uh, blacklist is, um, is totally unreasonable and outrageous uh, because all the journalists have done in the last APAC meeting is to ask uh, uh, Mr. Aquino of a few questions which uh, most Hong Kong people will have in mind. The Department of Foreign Affairs uh, in Manila uh, has uh, issued a statement that it will uh, recommend that the uh, policy or this uh, inclusion in the blacklisting, in the blacklist, uh, be reviewed, reassessed. Uh. But the Consul General said while the Foreign Ministry can make recommendations, the final decision rests with another department. Arthur Rakiola, ATV News. U.S. President Barack Obama has called for calm in a Missouri town which is waiting for a grand jury to decide whether to charge a white policeman who shot a black teenager. At the same time, another controversy is brewing, this time in the state of Ohio, where police shot and killed a 12-year-old boy who was waving a fake gun. This was where police shot and killed 12-year-old Tamir Rice. Officers were sent to Cadell Recreation Center Park in Cleveland, Ohio, after receiving a call about a youth brandishing a gun. Although the caller believed that the gun was not real, that information was not conveyed to the officers. The boy did not make any verbal threats or point the gun at police. But when he ignored orders to raise his hands, officers fired twice, hitting him in the abdomen. He underwent surgery but died in hospital. Police said the boy had an airsoft replica gun, which looks like a semi-automatic pistol. The shooting in Cleveland came amid rising tension in another U.S. state ahead of a grand jury ruling on whether to charge a white policeman for shooting and killing an unarmed black teenager. In a bid to calm the waters, President Barack Obama appealed directly to residents of Ferguson in Missouri. I think, first and foremost, keep protests peaceful. Um, you know, this is a country that uh, allows everybody to express their views. Any event as an excuse for violence uh, is contrary to rule of law and contrary to who we are. There have been protests in Ferguson for the past four days. In the latest, hundreds marched to demand justice for the victim, Michael Brown. We ready for whatever they, whatever, whatever happens, happens. Like we have to, we have to build ourselves as a community. We're going to make sure that we continue to fight against this injustice against black and brown people. Barriers have been erected around the courthouse where the grand jury is expected to deliver its decision this week. Supporters of the policeman said he opened fire in self-defense, but a witness said the victim had his hands up in the air when he was gunned down.